Okay, good afternoon everybody. Can you hear me all right with the microphone, yeah? Um, welcome to tonight's meeting of the... Can we... Uh, tonight's meeting of the Planning and Applications Committee. Uh, we'll go straight on to the agenda. Item number one is the evacuation procedure. We're not expecting a fire drill to take place, so if the alarms go off, we'll treat it for real. And if we can evacuate the chamber by these doors, either side of the chamber, down the front steps and meet across by the Yorkshire Bank across the road. And if anybody needed any help in getting out, give us a shout, we'll make sure that's done. Um, it's also a good time to remind people to put your phones on silent or to turn them off. <coughs> and just to uh, let people know that the council does record all of its meetings now and they go out on YouTube within the next couple of days, days or so. And just for those uh, people that are down to speak, if you press the large button on your console in front of you and speak into the microphone, and then press it again when you've, you've finished. OK? Uh, <coughs> um, it's also useful just to... Oh, I'll come, come on to that later. Item number two is to receive apologies for absence. I've got apologies from Councillor Llewellyn Nash and the substitute is Councillor Evans and Councillor Longdon, whose substitute is Councillor Jackson. We got any others? Can, yeah? Councillor Watkins isn't coming. Okay. Uh, item number three is to confirm the minutes of the meeting on the 14th of January. Are you happy that I signed those? Yes, yeah, okay, thank you. Item number four, to receive any declarations of disclosable pecuniary and other interests in accordance with the Member's Code of Conduct if they're not already listed on the agenda. None, thank you. Item five, are any declarations of contact that Members may have had with any, anybody involved in the applications? Councillor Evans. Um, 86 Maver Drive. Um, I accompanied Councillor Llewellyn Nash, who's the ward member, um, to visit um, a number of objectors who are in the gallery this evening. Um, I didn't speak, I didn't speak on the application, and I didn't indicate how I would vote because I didn't intend to be here. Which then takes us on to applications where the public have indicated to speak, so it will be the, the Maver Drive one first. Have you, is that how you've got it set up, Jackie? Um, but while Jackie's doing that, if I can just run through the process, although you may be already know. Sorry, can you not hear me? Not really. <laughs> uh, not sh just turn it up a notch, please, Wendy. It's got to be the furthest bit away as well. Have you done it? Is that any better or a bit more, Wendy? I think. How's that now? Is that any better? Okay, right. I'll perhaps move that up a bit as well. Oh, it's fell off again now. Won't be much luck tonight. Right. Yeah. So I was going to run through the process. What happens is. When we get to the item in front of us, uh, the officer will present the report. Following on from that, I take the speakers in the order that I've got them. And just for members' information, we've got a second speaker on New um, Maver Drive, um, Mrs. Patricia Moon. Uh, so, 
when you do speak, you're allowed three minutes. That's what the Constitution allows you. Um, if it looks like you're going to run over, I'll stop you once the egg timer goes off, just so that it's fair, everybody gets the same uh, amount of time. However, there's an opportunity for members to ask any points of clarification. It can only be to clarify something that you've said in your address. And then we go back to the officer to see if they've got anything else to add to it. And then once something's moved and seconded, the committee will debate the matter and hopefully reach a decision. We normally make a decision on the day, but there's the odd occasion where we perhaps defer for extra information or a site visit, something like that. But normally we make the decision on the day. OK? Right, Jackie. Uh, item number two then, please. 86 Maver Drive. OK, thank you, Chair. This application is for the erection of a single-storey annex on vacant land which the applicant has purchased to the rear of the applicant's garden. The proposed single-storey annex is to be 4.4 metres wide by 12.4 metres long, with the eaves level being 2.43 metres and the overall height with a shallow pitch roof is under 3.4 metres. The applicant's garden extends approximately 14 metres from the back of the original house. The vacant land the annex is proposed to be built on is beyond this. The annex site is surrounded by rear gardens. Just to show you a little bit clearer, that's the applicant's property, that's his residential curtilage there, and this is the land that the application relates to. The applicant's property is largely painted render and is a two-storey semi-detached property similar to the surrounding properties. The property has a driveway providing parking for up to four cars to the front. The semi attached to the applicant's property, which is that one there, is 88 Maver Drive. <coughs> Further east is the rear gardens of New Common Road. To the west are the rear gardens of houses in Humphrey Davy Road of a similar design. The proposal backs onto 5 and 7 Humphrey Davy Road, those two properties there. To the south are the rear gardens of 1 and 2 Davy Lamp Close, which are relatively new properties. 140 New Common Road to the east of the site um, is also to the east of the site. All of these neighbours rear garden boundaries, as I say, back onto the site. The top topography is fairly flat, but the land the application relates to is at a slightly lower level, land level than the applicant's existing <coughs> rear garden. I'll show you a photo later. This application has been reported to committee at the request of Councillor Anne Llewellyn Nash. The only history for the applicant's property is for the approval of the conservatory to the rear. The site the annex is proposed on was part of a larger site that has been developed to provide dwellings in Davy Lamp Close and appears to be an area left over from the build, the full history of which is on page 31 of the agenda. There have been three letters of objection from three addresses, <coughs> proceed on page 32 of the agenda, plus a further response from one of these addresses and as printed on the addendum. The key issues to assess in the determination of this application are the principle of development, the impact of residential amenity, the impact of the visual amenity and the impact on highway safety. Apparently there is a covenant placed on the land but covenants are not a planning issue and is a legal issue between the person who placed the covenant on the land and the applicant. In terms of the principle of the development, the proposal is for an ancillary building to the main residential property for use as a study or games room, and it is within a residential area. Therefore, the principle of the use for ancillary residential use is considered acceptable, providing that residential and visual amenity is acceptable. In reference to the impact to residential amenity of neighbouring properties... These are broken down property by property in your agenda, but shown on the diagram on the screen in front of you uh, as a whole. The blue block in the middle is the position of the proposed annex in relation to all the surrounding properties, 
with a measurement shown from the back of the original parts of neighbouring houses to the fence boundary of the annex. The photographs depict the view from the proposed annex site to the neighbouring properties. The residential design guide uses distance standards from original primary habitable windows of properties to a proposed single storey building in order to assess the interest of protecting aspect and light. Only the original rear windows can be protected. <coughs> windows from extensions cannot be protected under the guidance. Many but not all the neighbouring properties, have rear extensions or outbuildings in their own gardens, blocking the views of the proposed annex to some. The residential design guide states that there should be a minimum of 12 metres distance from original habitable primary windows to a single storey wall. You will see from the sketch on screen the distance that leads exceeds at least 12 metres in all the cases. Again, I must emphasise this is from the back of the original house. There is a small toilet or shower room window proposed on the elevation to the properties in Humphrey Davy Road, but this is considered to be to a non-habitable room and is labelled to be obscure glaze necessary for privacy. In addition, any views from this window will be protected by the 1.8 metre fence in close proximity to this window. In conclusion, it is considered that the proposal is in compliance with the residential design guide to all of the neighbouring properties in terms of sense of protecting aspect and light to these neighbours' original rear windows and garden area. In relation to the impact on visual amenity, the presentation slide in front of you shows the various, eleva various elevations of the proposed annex, with the top left being the elevation that would be seen from the applicant's original garden. The bottom elevation shows the proposed elevation from Davy Lamp Close, and the proposed side elevations in the middle from the rear garden of Humphrey Davy Road, Humphrey Davy Road is on the middle left, and from Newcomen Road on the right. The photograph shown is the site as it currently stands. The proposed outbuilding is on a lower land level than the existing garden, and whilst it's relatively long at 12.4 metres, it is relatively low in height at 3.4 metres to the ridge. The materials proposed are concrete interlocking tiles and facing brickwork, so is in keeping with the surrounding area. It is therefore considered that the visual amenity is acceptable. However, it is recommended that if members approve the proposal, that a condition be placed on the approval to ensure materials will match the area. <coughs> In terms of the impact on highway safety, the proposal is ancillary to the main house and will therefore not impact on the number of parking spaces required for the existing residential property. And ensuring the annex remains ancillary to the house is considered to be a relevant condition if members decide to approve the application. In conclusion, the distance from the surrounding dwellings meets the distance standards within the residential design guide in relation to protecting aspect and light <coughs> to these neighbours' rear windows and garden area. The use is ancillary to the main house, so the principle of the development is considered acceptable and the materials are in keeping with the area. The neighbour concerns over the covenant placed on the land is not a current planning consideration and will be up to the applicant to resolve with the person who placed the covenant on the land. In conclusion, it's considered there is no valid planning reason to refuse the application upon and the recommendation is of approval subject to the conditions as printed on page 34 of the agenda and as per the addendum. Thank you, Chair. OK, thank you. Uh, for Councillor Sergeant, we'd actually, you've probably worked it out, but we're on item number two because there's speakers on that. Um, if I can ask Mrs Hirons then, please. It will. Can you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Yeah, good, 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 good. Um, let me just get up. You don't need... You don't need... No, I have to stand oh, up. Oh, OK. I'd li I like to stand up. However you feel comfortable. OK. Is that, you can hear me then. OK. 
Um, I'd like to start now um, and introduce myself. Um, good evening to everybody. It's Christine Hirons. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of Christopher Hirons, my husband, who's with me, and also Mick Hickson, and we come from 1 and 2 Davy Lamp Close. We're new Bedworth residents and on a new build site, and we're asking the planning committee to consider our comments and decline this application on the following. Um, we needed clarification um, that all residents who will be affected by this build were sent letters. If not, we are at an unfair advantage. The vacant land was part of a larger piece, which has already been mentioned, which had restrictions on, which has been explained. Um, it was set when sold to the builder and after new builds completed. Proposed development will be out of character to surrounding outbuildings. The original plans for the area would not have envisaged this type of building in the backyard. Plans show a bungalow-type building at the back of 86 and 88 Maver Drive, squeezed in with limited access. There's no access for emergency services, higher risk if heating and utilities are connected. Applicant owns 86 and 88 Maver Drive, leading to more doubt to long-term use. If there is a need for more space, other options should be considered, so preserving the uniformity of the surrounding homes and gardens. The applicant requests again studies with amenities. This also raises concerns. The building will block light and air to several properties, especially sunlight. There is potential for noise, music and change of use. The mainly, built, mainly brick built structure will be obtrusive to all homes overlooking the garden. Elgin residents surrounding this proposed development, some of health issues, will have their quality of life impacted. The choice my husband and I made to purchase our retirement home was based on where the bungalow was situated. The surrounding houses and their gardens and the knowledge at that time, the vacant land at the back of number one and number two, was to extend the garden. We are dismayed the application was submitted. Our future to spend a quiet, restful retirement is not so certain, and our mental well-being and enjoyment of life and that of our neighbours will be affected. Applicant is fully aware of the stress that was caused to all residents at the time of the new builds. Owners of the new builds are restricted not to build or extend for five years, um, set by residents and planning. No one was expecting one of the residents to want to build on land he purchased for the extension of his garden. It was not spare land, it was part of our land originally, and the builder told us that, and that it was going to be used as a garden to be extended okay. on 86. Thank okay, you. I do have to right. stop you there. Thank Thanks you. for listening. That's okay. Are there any points of clarification? No. Can I speak? Not yet. And the other speaker. Oh, Mrs. H sorry, uh, Mrs. Moon is the other speaker that I've got. Press the big button and then just pull the mic round. To lift your mic up; it will be nearer to you. That's it. I hope this new council has a sympathetic ear. If you've looked into your archives, you will now be aware that we won a long-running battle regarding the saga and the intrusion of a piece of land at the rear of our gardens. Now it appears we never won the war. I stand here once again weary with the hope to deter the harmful effect of the development and the impact it will have upon us. I am surprised that many of the residents connected to this site was not informed. Therefore, they never had the chance to object. We strongly object to the proposed building as it would be slotted in like a railway sleeper. It would be overbearing and have a negative effect on the surrounding environment, more so to the residents close to it, and it will diminish and overshadow the light to their homes. Number seven in particular of Humphrey Devery Road it will only be one foot two inches away from their garage. As well as an overdevelopment, the consequence from this building for the purpose of an entertainment would become, become a nuisance, especially 
if it includes intrusive nightlight. Noise and disturbances resulting from its use would be interfering with our own properties and gardens to the detriment of our own health and well-being. And to conclude, we were informed it is for an entertainment building and if the council are really mindful to pass this, can you really ensure us that it will not be used other than for himself and not be used as an entertainment building for the public? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Sorry? Oh, yeah, sorry. Can, I, you, can you press your button again? Um, any points of clarification? No? Jackie, anything you want to cover at the moment? No? In that case, to enable debate to take place, can I move the recommendation, which is to grant planning permission subject to the conditions printed? Is that seconded? Any member? Councillor Evans. To, um, the officers, if possible. Um, one, of, one of the things that I always see in uh, the reports of the, the planning committee, which I can't, I can't see um, on this this individual one, is the um, the list about um, consultation responses. Uh, in particular, you know, like the highways, fire service, things like that. And um, it leads into the to, to one of my concerns about. Um, access for the emergency services should you know there be a fire or whatever and um, what access would there be should there ever be a fire in that um in that new building um have the fire and rescue service been um informed about this application and have they come back with any response or any objection <coughs> hasn't been any consultation, statutory consultations on the application purely because it's in somebody's back garden. So the, it doesn't mean a new drive or a new vehicular access. Um, generally, the fire and rescue team would look at the weekly list. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't automatically be notified just for a householder planning application. They would for the larger sites um, where we're talking about new domestic <coughs> premises or... Re or um, commercial properties but not on normal householder sites but they would have had the opportunity of seeing that on the weekly list <coughs> Councillor Wilson Councillor Evans raises a point I hadn't considered and I think it's a very important and valid point actually because this isn't just a minor application or an extension to a property in my view where it would be with the main house if there was a fire there is a substantial building at the rear of this property which, if it is being used as an entertainment centre, according to the paperwork, there would be some kind of electronic electronics there which would be a risk. There is a risk. You can mitigate it, but you can't eliminate the risk. So um, if the committee isn't minded to refuse, I would certainly want to defer to ask the fire service the specific question about this application because in all the time I've sat on planning normally when we deal with something like this it is a standalone project in a rear garden mm -hmm. or it is something which is only a minor application this is actually quite a big application in 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 that location um which concerns me slightly we are supposed to not really approve back garden development. I know there's been changes on, on that uh, principle over the years. I think the current favour is not to um, do that. I'm, I stand, I'm happy to stand corrected if that's the case. Um, to me, this is back garden development. And I'm looking at uh, page 40 in the agenda and just looking at the diagram. And to me, that seems over-intensive on the site. If you look at everything in total, I know that if you take out the um, shed, it does say on there that the shed will be uh, relocated or removed. If it's removed, all right, it's not as bad. But if it's relocated, you're still going to have that area somewhere within um, that boundary. To me, it is over-intensive on the site. 
um, and also looking at it, I have concerns about the design in that those uh, roof lights are actually pitched towards the other properties. And I would have preferred as a mitigation that those roof lights be on the other incline, so facing in towards the actual applicant rather than towards others to try and mitigate some of the um, concerns of residents. Um, so on those two grounds about the design, specifically those roof lights, and also to me it being over intensive on that site, I don't think I can vote to approve this application, Chair. Councillor Graham. Same concerns have just been raised by Councillor Wilson, uh, particularly in terms of how large this is, because it seems to be as wide as the house itself is long, except in uh, single storey. And what I find quite um, unusual is that it's a games room that also has a shower. I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I suppose it can have some quite strenuous games of table tennis, but I've never really felt the need to have a shower afterwards. So I, I do wonder whether they do intend to stick by that um, condition attached, not to turn it into an additional bedroom, uh, and whether that is an, even an enforceable condition in the long run, because I, I don't know whether the council would have checks um, every so often to make sure it's being used for that purpose, what they could really legally do if they don't abide by it. And for that purpose, I find it hard to support this. But if it were to go ahead, uh, I'd certainly want to see the... Um, uh, condition uh, that um, Councillor Evans uh, uh, proposed attached, uh, but also the, one of the speakers said that um, there should be a, a condition attached uh, to make sure it doesn't become a public um, games room. I don't know whether that would be likely or not, but I don't see the harm in attaching that uh, if it's uh, and if condition four is enforceable, then I imagine that, that condition would be enforceable as well. I'd also be happy to um, second the deferral for extra information regarding fire safety that um, Councillor Wilson put forward. Right, well, I'm going to be clear on that because it was mentioned, but then Councillor Wilson went on to say that he wasn't going to support this application anyway. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not sure whether that was on the table anyway. Anyway, um, could you, Jackie, could you clarify the future change of use because when I looked at this I was thinking oh you know it would be useful to remove the permitted development rights for, for that purpose but the way it's worded it's almost as though it's the same sort of thing on that condition but can you clarify that for us about any future use I can do chair um, the original condition that we put actually on the agenda which was condition 4 did refer to it not changing to a bedroom However, we can't really condition as a bedroom. We can only really condition as being ancillary to the main house. So that condition has actually been changed on the addendum to... Um, you can just see it on the top part of the addendum as being purely ancillary to the dwelling. So an ancillary means it's got to be uh, for residential use. <coughs> Obviously, if we were to receive complaints that it was used to... Um, the wider public obviously they can have neighbours their own friends and such visiting the site we couldn't stop that but if it seemed to be more intensive and it was advertised as a entertainment for the general public not ancillary to the house then yes we could look at enforcement action on that also we would be looking at um, any noise issues that would be an environmental yeah. health issue OK, that's what I was going to say, yeah. OK, um, just a couple of points I've got on it, and uh, it, they've come about because of other things that have been said. Uh, because of what was said about... I mean, we've, got, we've only got anecdotal evidence about it, its possible future use and, and noise, but I would imagine that would have to come under some sort of licensing regime as well and not, and not planning. Um, the normal statutory consultations that we do with the emergency services and that, I, I, I get where you're coming from on that, but would it have been in the case that they would have been consulted on previous applications here when it was for bungalows and houses because it was, you know, because it was a larger, larger application? Uh, and if they, if they were, I'm guessing it wasn't a problem because there was approvals in the past for bungalows, not for houses, but for bungalows. 
Yes, they would have been consulted on the like, the the, um, the estate, the development of David Lamp Close, but it wouldn't have shown an actual building in that position. Um, so it's a completely separate application. Okay, all right. Okay, so unless there's any other speakers, we've got what we've got in front of us. I'm just going to clarify whether you have, you know we vote on it as it is. If it's lost, then you can come back with something else. Or are are you looking at what you mentioned about deferral? I'll leave it as a as a proposal, chair. If it gets, see if it gets a second during um, the next meeting, then we'll consider. So you're moving deferral so that the emergency services can be specifically consulted on yeah. this item. Okay, and that was seconded by Councillor Gran. Um, I'm going to take the vote on that and not what's on in front of us on this paper, yeah? So all those in favour of that? One, two, three, four, five, six. And against? One, two, three, four, five. And abstentions. Okay, so that's um, that's deferred. So that extra consultation can take place with the emergency services. Yep. Okay. Happy with that, Jackie? Yep. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. You don't have to stay. You don't. Yeah. <laughs> you don't. You're more than welcome to stay, but you don't have to. But so it's def it's deferred until that consultation takes place. It's so, yeah, we're not. Yeah, it's been deferred for consultation with the emergency services. If you've got any other comments in between that taking place and that, get in touch with the officers. Yeah, we can add them to to it when it comes back to us. Okay, thank you. Right, if we can go back to, thank you, if we can go back to item number one then, please. Rugby Road, Bulkington. Okay, thank you, Chair. This application is for the erection of four dwellings at 34 Rugby Road, Bulkington. The scheme has been amended at the request of planning officers during the consultation period and the proposal is now two storeys and consists of two blocks of semi-detached, four properties in total. The application proposes two parking spaces per property plus two visitor parking spaces to the side, so that's ten spaces overall. The original design was of a terrace block of four properties at two and a half storeys with dormers to the rear and having eight parking spaces in total, which was two per, per property. The site was previously a bungalow, now demolished, and is near the <coughs> junction of Rugby and Withybrook Roads and Shilton Lane. The vehicular access is onto Rugby Road and the site is fairly close to Balkington Village Centre. The surrounding area is of residential and is a mix of properties and character with no overriding design. The adjoining properties are 32 Rugby Road, which is this one there, and 2 Shilton Lane, which is this one there. Those two blocks are the proposed two blocks of semis. 32 Rugby Road is a detached two-storey gabled house with roof lights to the front with a rear ground floor extension. This property has a large detached outbuilding, two storeys on the boundary to the site with gardens to the side and rear. 2 Shilton Lane is on the opposite side boundary of the site and is a detached bungalow with a hip roof with a driveway closest to the boundary with a site leading to a detached garage. You'll see the driveway there and the detached garage for that property. To the rear of the site are the gardens of semi-detached properties in Brewer Road. You can't see them on there, but you can see them on the location plan there. Okay. 
On the opposite side of Rugby Road, the properties are two-storey of a mix of designs including semi and detached dwellings. These are the ones I'm referring to now. The site has been cleared, so there is no significant landscaping other than a hedge to the, front, to the road frontage and semi-mature shrubs along the southeastern boundary with Two Shilton Lane and some to the rear boundary. There was a previous planning approval for the site, which has now expired and which was for a bungalow and a house. There have been three responses of objections from two addresses and a petition of eight signatories, all proceed on the agenda on page 17. The objections were for the original scheme of four terrace properties of two and a half storeys. No further responses were received subsequent to letters being sent to advise the scheme had been amended to semi-detached two-storey properties. However, the amended letters do advise that previous comments will still be taken into consideration. In terms of the principle of the development, national and local planning policy states the presumption in favour of sustainable development – and a core principle is to encourage the effective use of previously developed land, provided that it is not of high environmental value. Whilst residential curtilages and garden land are specifically excluded from the definition of previously developed land, there is not a presumption in principle against developing this land, providing there are no other issues. Officers consider that the site is in a sustainable location, close to services and public transport facilities. In reference to the impact on existing residential amenity of neighbours, the site is surrounded, as I say, by residential development. In relation to the impact to 32 Rugby Road, again, this that property there, the nearest ground floor windows to the rear of this neighbour are not are impacted at 45 degrees by the nearest proposed semi. In any case, these rear windows are to an extension and cannot be protected. The nearest first floor window to this property is not impacted at 60 degrees by the proposal. Therefore, the proposal complies with paragraph 9.6 of the residential design guide in terms of sense of enclosure to windows of this property. The nearest semi-detached block is on the boundary line with this neighbouring property <coughs> and projects almost seven metres from the rear of this adjacent property. The distance I'm referring to is this distance here, so it's from the rear of where the residential property is next door to where the first block finishes. As I say, the residential design guide would normally say that uh, that would be acceptable up to three metres in depth. However, this three metre depth is intended where the houses abut one another on a, both on a boundary. As you will see in this particular case, this neighbour's property is set back from the side boundary by 6.7 metres. So the impact is reduced to this rear of this property, which we t generally tend to say was there. In addition, as I say, the nearest area is already enclosed by this neighbour's detached two-storey outbuilding. I have put the outbuilding on there to show you the relationship between the existing and the proposal. That, that is the two-storey outbuilding in this neighbour's property. This area would also not be considered to be the most usable private amenity space, which would be generally be considered to be the rear of the property, so it would be across the back there. And in fact, if you can see from the Google Earth map, it is actually probably closer to the bottom of the garden in this, in this property because of extensions. In addition, the previous approval in 2014 considered that a house in a similar location to this, although not quite on the boundary, was acceptable and the residential design guide has not changed in the meantime. There are no primary habitable <coughs> side windows to be impacted upon at this neighbouring property. A first floor side bathroom window is proposed overlooking the side of this neighbouring property but as this is to a bathroom, it will be obscure glazed and therefore have limited views. 
In relation to the impact of Two Shilton Lane, which is also an adjoining neighbour, this neighbour's property, which is that one, is a bungalow. There is only one side facing window to this neighbour which serves a bathroom and therefore cannot be protected. The side of the bungalow is separated from the site boundary by 3.4 metres, as you can see there, which is the neighbour's driveway leading to the garage. So that's not really private amenity because it's open to the road. The nearest rear elevation of the proposed dwellings are roughly in line with this neighbour's rear extension. You can just see the relationship there. So no private amenity space near to the existing bungalow will be impacted upon. However, the nearest proposed semi-detached property, which is this, Block 2, is at a slight angle to this neighbouring property and means the nearest semi will have rear first floor windows overlooking some of this neighbour's garden. We're referring to this part here. The nearest first floor window is to an ensuite, so will be obscure glazed, won't provide overlooking. The nearest first floor habitable window to this new property is seven metres from the boundary with this neighbour and therefore it does comply with the seven metres set out in the Residential Design Guide, paragraph 9.4. In any case, views from this window would be towards the bottom of the bungalow's garden and not the most usable private garden space, which would tend to be closer to the bungalow. Therefore, the proposal does comply with paragraph 9.6 of the Council's Residential Design Guide to this neighbouring property. In relation to other neighbouring properties, to the rear of the site, these are 50 and 52 Brewer Road. You can just see them on the plan there. It's probably better actually seeing it on the Google Earth plan there or on our Ordnance Survey plan there. Sorry, there. These properties are a minimum of 15 metres from the boundary with the site and the nearest proposed property is located a further 50 metres away from the boundary given a separation distance of approximately 30 metres. That distance is shown there. The Residential Design Guide, paragraph 9.3, requires a distance of 20 metres between windows of two-storey properties. So again, this paragraph is well met. And therefore, the policy complies with the residential design guide to these properties in terms of loss of light or privacy. The properties on the opposite side of Rugby Road, so on the other side of the road there, are approximately 30 metres from the front of the proposed properties, so again, complies with the residential design guide. In conclusion, in terms of the residential amenity, it is considered that the proposal is largely in compliance with the guidelines in the Residential Design Guide. Where it is not in strict compliance, it is considered there are mitigating circumstances which makes it acceptable. In relation to the impact on visual amenity, the site is largely cleared. The photograph on the screen, shown at the bottom, shows the cleared site from the front entrance through the Harris fencing that protects the site at the moment. The design is in keeping with the area and the height reflects the neighbouring house. The top elevational drawing in front of you is that of the proposed street scene. So that's the neighbouring bungalow that I've just described. These are the proposed dwellings and that's <coughs> the adjacent house. You will see the relationship between them. The bottom drawing uh, shows the proposed front elevations. Obviously, there's two lots of those, as shown there. The proposal has gable roofs, brick detailing, and gable canopy porches above the front doors. The two lots of semis balance one another, and the application detail states the roofs will be concrete tiles and the external walls will be brickwork. It is considered that if members approve the application... The brick and tile specification can be conditioned so that external materials and boundary treatments can be approved at a later stage by officers. Visual amenity is therefore considered acceptable subject to conditions. The proposal will require the loss of the hedge to the front 
for highway safety reasons. And there could potentially be a further loss of shrubs to the sides, but none are considered to be worthy of a tree preservation order. And they could, in fact, as a domestic property, just be taken out anyway. In relation to the impact on highway safety, county highways have no objections subject to the conditions on your agenda. It is considered that two parking spaces per property plus two visitor spaces for the development is a satisfactory amount of parking and refusal on highway safety grounds would be difficult to defend at appeal. In conclusion, it's considered that highway safety is acceptable. In reference to flooding, the site is in flood zone 1, which is the least likely to flood, and Seven Trent Water have not responded to the application. In conclusion, the principle of the development is considered acceptable, and the scheme is largely in compliance with the residential design guide in terms of the impact on neighbouring residential properties. The design is considered to be in keeping with the area, and as Warwickshire County Council, have, highways have no objection, subject to conditions, it's considered that highway safety is acceptable. Flooding and drainage is also not considered to be an issue here. The recommendation is therefore of approval, subject to the conditions as printed on page 20 of the agenda. Thank you, Chair. OK, thanks, Jackie. <coughs> we don't have any speakers on this, so to enable debate to take place, can I move the recommendation, which is to grant... Uh, <coughs> planning permission subject to the conditions printed is that seconded thank you any member councillor smith patch it's one of those uh, areas that we all pass we've all got one it's been derelict for a long time desperately needs something doing with it the bushes around are all overgrown to the point that they're overtaking the path now. When I first saw it, I thought it was a little bit over intense on that spot, but I think if they're taking away some of the shrubbery, it'll actually look bigger than it does at the moment. So I'm fairly comfortable with that. My other concern was highway safety, but I see highways of... Uh, have said that's okay, but that is a really busy junction, and I was concerned about how they'll manoeuvre in front of the houses to be able to drive off front ways, because I wouldn't want to reverse out of there. Can I just ask where the access is going to be for the... Is that the original access is the only point with the drop curb? Yes, it is. Yep. Okay, that's fine then. I, I'm fairly satisfied with that then on the whole I'm for this we need something doing with that corner <coughs> plot houses will look much better than the derelict site uh, and it might even make that junction a little bit better if some of the shrubbery is cleared away because you'll have a clear vision across it as you come down Shilton Lane so on the whole I'm in favour of it thank you recommendation is as printed which is the grant planning permission Subject to the conditions printed. All those in favour of that? That's unanimous. Okay, so that's approved. Um, I don't have any emergency items, so thank you very much for your attendance. Declare the meeting closed.